following governmental laws? No, no, no. What I mean to say is, if you're supposed to choose, there's always a right way and wrong way of doing things. So what is it always? The right way takes more time to do things. Oh, that's easy. I mean, if I put ice creams and rust cooler and chocolate and a glass of beer, I mean, that's easy. Boom, 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 boom. You're stumped up. You have to learn to discriminate. You have to use your intelligence. We are always in this Mahabharata situation in our mind. Should I work to improve myself? Should I just tread water and don't put any effort in? Or should I just be lazy and let what happens happen and sink? It is an interesting way of looking at things as you just expressed it. I think it's quite the opposite. I think if you endeavor with good morality and good principles to do the right thing according to the rules of this life, then you are building a solid house that's creating a good future, that's bringing Bhagawan into your life, and eventually you will surrender. I think going the easy way, what appears to be easy, is in fact the hardest way of all. Because your body becomes ill, you get too much alcohol in your blood system, too much cigarette in your body, you don't exercise, your mind becomes agitated, then your family leave you, then your boss fires you, then you get problems here, problems there, problems there, then you've got to try and work out all these problems. In the meanwhile, the one who actually did the right thing, worked hard with principle to understand the true nature of the I, was an honest man of integrity, their house is a different kind of house. Even if their house was to fall down in the storm, they have their character intact. They have their strength of purpose clear. They know where they're going. And they take everything as prashad. This is the depth of knowledge I'm talking about. Taking everything as grace. But the one who took the easy way, they're falling apart. They're emotionally, mentally, physically depreciating atrophying. So I don't actually agree with you. <laughs> Is that fair? Maybe I've had a different experience of the case. Maybe it's too early. You know, I think I think anybody who's even in trouble, and I include all of us because we all, all, without exception, made mistakes. And we will all make mistakes. This is not a judgment call on an individual's character. It's just a plea to each and every one of us to try and make decisions that are beneficial to ourselves as opposed to ones that are not beneficial. For instance, there are shades of improvement. If somebody's in a tamasic state, they can still make a positive decision to be less tamasic. They can still climb out of their ditch. You, that, that Saint Valmiki, he he had fallen into such a dark state. He couldn't say the name Ram. He had so much transgression wrapped around him. So his Guru Dev said, say Mala, which is Ram backwards. He didn't explain this is Ram backwards. He just said, say Mala. Following the Guru's advice, having faith in the Guru, he kept repeating Mala, and in the end, his love and faith in his guru got to such a point that he surrendered and became a saint. So the meaning behind that particular story, we do make mistakes, every one of us. 
you need to forgive yourself, you need to start moving towards the light. Nobody's a lost cause because the Atma is an eternal power and you don't know when your good sanskars are around the corner. It's like Maharaji once gave an example in the underneath a house, buried in the soil was a treasure. And he explained, if you dig over here, you'll go to Mukti, if you dig over here, there's a snake, if you dig over here, there's, I can't remember the four, four things, but basically he gave accurate, accurate description where you should dig. If you dig here, you will find your spiritual power, you'll find your love for Bhagwan, you'll move across Maya into the divine nature, just dig here. And when you start digging, he never said how deep it was. Never said. So you dig and nothing. Dig nothing, dig nothing, dig nothing. You don't know when your spade is going to go crunk and hit the lid of that box where the gold is, so to speak. So I have seen people who seemingly are not going very well in their life at all. And their spade hits that box. Suddenly they get a satori, they get an awakening, they get a, an epiphany, a realization. Oh, look what I've been doing to myself. And they turn themselves around 180 degrees. And they can accelerate past those who've been with Maharaji all their life and going nowhere because they've become complacent. In Manga, there were a family, I recall them. They had their house built against the wall of Maharaja's house. So of the four walls, the main wall was Sri Maharaji's wall, and the other three, they built. And they lived in there for years, but they were not satsangs. In the end, Maharaji wanted that land, he offered them a certain amount of money so they could relocate. They, they gained, materially they gained. Maharaji uh, embraced them in such a generous way. Now they're living far and they're still not satsangs. Yet there are people in New Zealand and Canada and the US and Singapore and Hong Kong, they don't even live in India and they are satsangs. So I mean to say, proximity is one thing. It's not at all the main thing. It's what do you feel and hear? And when you hear these words, if they resonate, you can. Because you and everyone else here has willpower. You can hear these words, you can make the resolve, I'll move towards it. And see what happens in life, you see. So whether you have made wrong decisions or you've had different life experiences, Para dharma is an eternal knowledge. You can't add to it, you can't take to it. Infinity times infinity equals infinity, plus infinity equals infinity, divided by infinity equals infinity. This is complete knowledge. You can't take it, you can't, you can't lessen it, you can't add to it. It's complete. So, this knowledge is available for everybody. Everybody. There is no discrimination. In fact, bhakti, out of all of the pathways, all pathways have to come to bhakti anyway. Even a jnani has to come to bhakti. Labhate uh, bhakta param vino. You have to surrender to God in form with love. And then if you want to merge into the ocean of, of bliss, you can do that. But you have to come to bhakti. And all the disciplines, karma yoga, jnana yoga, kriya yoga, all of these yogas require great mental strength. And bhakti is easy. It's for everybody. Why? Oh my lord, I'm an idiot. Please, show me how to love you. Let me be the best I can be. Give me strength. Let me come closer. 
You just, in other words, need, as Maharaji said in the talk earlier, ruchi, ruchi, interest. Dilchas, interest. You have interest and you're sincere, then no matter where you are, no matter what you've done, you can climb up and up and finish it. So, I think we should stop, we should try and stop analyzing. Is this a good deed? Is that a bad deed? Is this a right deed? Is this a wrong deed? And come like a child, be innocent like a child. You come to your Guru Dev and you say, please advise me. How can I live in this world and increase my love for you? And he'll say, okay, Ashok, you go back to Sydney or Singapore, wherever you live, and you do this work. I want you to support my work. I want you to do this meditation. I want you to come and see me. I want you to think of me. And then slowly, slowly, your ship rights. It stops the rocking. This is positive, negative. Oh, I like that. I don't like this. I like that. I don't like this. And slowly, your ship settles. You're no longer in a little rowboat. You're in the big ocean liner. The balustrades have gone out. Your ship is sitting nicely on the water. And the helmsman, not you anymore. Guru Dave is the helmsman. He's steering your ship now. Why? Because you've learned to love and have faith in him. I know that takes time. But seriously, this is the university of life we are talking about now. Not for an engineering degree or being a lawyer or a doctor or being a dancer or a painter. This is the university of life. So naturally, there is some application, but the main qualification, interest, and then learning humility. It's not too hard. Yet Maharaji's knowledge, you know, Maharaji has three beautiful daughters. They are, one is three years older, the other two just marginally younger than me. So we're kind of in a similar age group. And when I was studying in India to become Swami, I had the brief to teach them individually one hour every day how to speak English. Uh, but that's beside the point. But the point I am really making is, as I remember them, Maharaji gave a talk once in the, in the hall and the three daughters came out going, and I said, what? They said, oh, that was a Jagat Guru speech. What did that mean? Maharaj spoke with such high philosophy. He went deep and deep and deep and deep. And these three daughters, two of them are doctors, PhD, and the eldest one, I mean, that's, that, I hold them to be uh, something very, very special. They are sharp. They have lived their whole life with Maharaji. They have heard every utterance that's come out of his mouth. And they walked away saying that I couldn't understand that. It was so deep. When I was living with Maharaji in Suri, there was a time when he'd come out every morning around 5.30 and he would walk past where I was giving an English class at that time to Chotati. And as Maharaji would walk past, he'd be singing shlokas. And to my amazement, many times, I would see Chodhidi reach for a piece of paper and a pen and start furiously writing. And she's a Sanskrit scholar. I said, what, what? She said, oh, I've never heard that one before. Never heard that one before. <laughs> Maharaji, all the Pracharaks have to learn 3,000 shlokas and some of them about 20 lines deep. Me, it was 900, which I reduced to five. But he comes past, he's singing a shloka, and his daughter, who's heard every utterance of him, is in such tune with him, writes down the new shloka. So you want intelligence. There's something very different. We don't have to be Jagat Guru. He's just showing his amazing personality 
all of his strength and beauty and love so that we've got the good sense to say, okay, I'll sit in your boat. <laughs> he does all the work, for sure. When you learn this, you won't feel so bad. He just said, I'm trying to give you my intellect. Will you accept it? What do you mean? I want to give you my intellect means that when I give you advice, you follow what I'm advising. That's what it means. So this is a wonderful, wonderful path. He gives you deep knowledge when you feel you need it. If you want to impress people at the dinner table. <laughs> I can now with confidence sit down with, I think, just about anybody in the world who's not a devotee and hold my own. But with devotees, I pale. Because when I became a Swami, as I think I said the other day, my inaugural speech, I'm trying to speak shlokas in Sanskrit for the first time in my life publicly. What to speak of all the Swamis sitting in the front row? The 800 people sitting there were smouthing the shlokas with me. Such an august body of scholars. <laughs> and I was told, give them a talk. Yeah, right. So apart from the devotees, most people, it's very easy to work out. They're looking for love. They're looking for happiness. They're building their house as if they'll always be here. They don't know about the art now. They're not... I don't understand what makes the human mind what it is. I don't understand these simple, simple, simple things. Instead, they can talk quantum physics, they can talk anthropology, they can talk about all kinds of amazing equations, etc. But this stuff, they don't know. This is why this knowledge, it's the foundation of thought. It takes it right back to the heart. And from the heart it rolls out. On the furthest expression, it's pride. On the closest expression, it's humility. Ah, <laughs> such good stuff. So, don't think on the negative. You think on the positive. Because you are Atma. You are Anj. You are of Sri Krishna. You do want to love. You are not disqualified. You are a member of the club. You are a member of the conscious club. Which is what? Atma. Which belongs to who? Para-atma. We are family. Whether we're bright family, thick family, stupid family, ugly, healthy or sickly. We are. Whether you are a Christian, a Hindu, a Muslim, an Eskimo, or a monkey. <laughs> we are the same club. So you have admittance. It's just whether you can put your self-doubt, your pride, or whatever it is that's stopping you, put it aside. Come forward. This is what I think. Well, actually, it's not what I think at all. It's what Maharaji taught me. Do you know what Maharaji once said about his pracharas? He said they are tota. He said they are parents. What? God is good. They haven't got a clue what they're saying. They mouth my words with no brain. But later, they are the most blessed because every day they have to repeat these words and I have hope that sometime in their life they'll actually understand them. And the day they understand them, job done. So it's a great life. So we do, each of us, mouth these words without much depth. But the longer you get, stick around these thoughts, the easier it gets. There's two questions.